Welcome everyone to our, the, our Lunch and Learn program sponsored by the Red River Valley Asperger Autism Network. We are a nonprofit organization whose mission is to empower, support, educate, and advocate for persons on the autism spectrum and their families. The format today is a brief uh, overview of the topic, followed by a question and answer session. We're privileged to have on our, our panel today, Adults with Asperger's uh, Syndrome. Our presenter today is Margie Gray, who is Vice President of the Red River Valley Asperger Autism Network, and on our Speakers Bureau. And I would like for the panelists to introduce themselves. You want to start, John? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I grabbed Chris at the wrong time. Uh, my name is John Foley. I have Asperger's and I am more than willing to share my personal experiences to help parents and other people with Asperger's as much as I possibly can. Thank you. Thank you. I also have AS. I'm also the board of directors for the Red River Valley Asperger Autism Network. And I am a grad student at NDSU. Thank you. Margie? Okay. Um, so I have a 10 year old son who was diagnosed with Asperger's when he was in kindergarten. Um, so about, gosh, he's 10 and a half, so let's do the math. He was six, so I'm getting close to six years, or five years ago now. Um, when we started uh, thinking about topics for the summer, um, you know, it takes a while to prepare for the beginning of school. Um, transitions and being having that mental readiness to be ready to go back to school can take some time so we thought that this might be good timing for this topic and we're going to offer just a few ideas here um, and definitely if there are additional ideas that, that come from the audience that's wonderful and I know John and Chris both will be offering their experience as well so number one preparation is key um, the, the thing that we, we wanted to focus on was setting up positive experiences. Um, and one of the things that, that can be really useful, um, a lot of schools do a back to school night, and having that opportunity to go back and um, maybe even doing it before the back to school night, because on back to school night there's a lot of people, it can be crowded, it can be busy, a little bit chaotic. Going there when it's very quiet and calm um, can be really a useful thing to do. And just you know, meeting the teacher or teachers, um, seeing the classroom, maybe seeing where they're going to set. Some teachers will even um, let, let them choose where they're going to sit initially so that they're in a place where they're comfortable. Um, walking routes to classrooms. This is especially important when going from like elementary to middle school or junior high when in elementary school they're not changing classrooms during the day. That's a huge difference when, when it gets to the point where they're having to change classes during the day and walking that path. You know, are you going to have to go to your locker before you go to the class? Really planning all that stuff, that stuff out and rehearsing it. Um, locker location, cafeteria, being, you know, especially for little kids, going and having an opportunity to play on the playground before school begins, so where they're going to do recess. Um, all of those things can help to build that familiarity and the comfort level so that everything isn't new on the first day of school. Um, additionally, setting up positive experiences, we do, um, this was something that we started doing a couple years ago, and it has, it's, once we did it, I was like, oh my gosh, why didn't we do this sooner? We do a team meeting the morning of back to school night. And we meet with his teacher, all of his support staff, the OT, the SLP, um, his special ed teacher, uh, the principal's there a lot of times. Um, and it gives him a chance to sort of reacquaint himself with everybody that he does know and to meet his teacher in the context of, you know, even if he met his teacher the year before, which that's something that we do as well. Um, it gives them a chance to get to, you know, reacquaint and, and get used to being with that person again. We talk through his schedule, and that's where we work out 
when his, o he gets sensory breaks. Um, and so we work out when his sensory breaks are going to be, when he's going to be working with a special ed teacher, what times he is going to, we need to be really um, aware that would be helpful to have para support. So we talk through all of that kind of thing. The thing we learned, our learning last year was that we need to keep that part of it brief for him and not let him go do his own thing while we sort of work through any bigger picture items because he got a little bit bored toward the end of his last one. But he has told us that it's made a huge difference. And then and he walked away from the first one saying, you know, I'm almost excited about going back to school. And, and I think that building that comfort level and letting him know what his schedule is going to be like had a big part of that. Focusing on transition, on the transition from summer to school, it's, you know, it's like, start now. Um, you know, talking about, and, and this is something that you really have to gauge based on your child's needs. If I were to start talking about positive experiences from school last year or in previous years right now, that would only increase his anxiety. That's something that we'll start doing like the, in the few days before school starts. But gradually building the new routines, that's something that we'll start now. We're going to start working our way back to a school year bedtime. We've gotten a little lax over the summer with bedtime. And so that's something that's going to be a transition for him. And wake up time. He's gotten to sleep a little bit later than he'll be able to sleep during the school year. So we'll start backing that up very gradually, giving, taking really baby steps in terms of getting him used to those new schedules. Um, you know, Sometimes during the summer, we can be sort of lax with responsibilities, too. Um, you know, focusing on things like, okay, it's important that you keep up with whatever it is that is in his hand. Make sure that you take all of your belongings out of the back seat of the car when you get out of the car. Um, really starting to focus on the things that will be part of their routine, what, or part of his routine, once school starts. Those are the things that we're starting to do now and preparing for the following day the night before. You know, when we are in that mode of him being ready the night before, mornings are so much easier once he's back in school. So, but we, but we don't really do that during the summer. And so we need to work on getting back into that kind of a routine. If you keep that up all year long, more power to you. I think that that's a great thing. We're just not that disciplined in our home. Um, social learning tips. So one of the thing, one of the big things that happens when they go back to school is they're in all these social situations again, right? So having those those tips, anticipating situations, anticipating the fact that they're going to be meeting new people. We've been reinforcing, hey, even though you're going to a different school and there are going to be two elementaries combining at your new in in this grade at your new school. You know a lot of those kids already. Remember, you met so-and-so in football or so-and-so somewhere else. And so we really start to anticipate the social situations and then even going so far as practicing. What would you do if, you know, what do you do when you're meeting someone new? What do you do when someone says something and you really don't know what they mean and you don't know how to respond? Um, setting up those kinds of, of situations and practicing them can be really helpful. And identifying trusted advisors as school as an emergency go-to person. So who is it that you would go talk to? If you were really upset about something or really nervous about something, who are you going to go talk to? Is it going to be your case manager? Is it going to be your SLP? You know, and giving, them a couple, giving him a couple of options is important to me so that he knows, so that he has, a, he has that safe place that he can go to. That, that that alone will lower his anxiety level because he knows that he's got a safe place to go to. So those are, those are important um, pieces to, to what we, the way we approach things. Um, Joanne is going, would you like to go ahead and, and add to the social learning piece of it right now? She's been to um, social, a social learning conference and has some other tips that she can offer. I think the 
the thing about this that strikes me each time we talk about it is that these are the kinds of things, the strategies and the little techniques that help all kids. So it's useful for all kids, but I think it's critical for our kids that we plan ahead and think ahead and anticipate potential sticky spots and then have a way to practice. And um, one of the things that worked that I think is really helpful at, at all age levels, because my grandson just turned 15 this summer, is social stories. Now, we used to write them out when he was in elementary school. They'd write a social story and practice. He got really upset in fourth grade that he was fearful he was going to miss the bus. And he would just get really panicky at the end of the day. And he never did miss it. And his teacher always made sure he was there in time and walked the kids down and, you know, so we made a social, we wrote a social story with the teacher about um, what was going to happen at the end of the day, uh, how he could count on the teacher, that she always made sure of this, this, and this. And it, it, it ended with, I know I'm going to be able to get there on time and I don't have to worry. But that, and we read that over and over at home and they did it at school and then we remind every once in a while. And that really brought his anxiety level down and it was fine. But you can also do that about how to handle things on the playground. And I do, we do have a handout about how to write social stories. There's a couple of different kinds of sentences that you put in there. Sometimes people do too, or teachers kind of do too much of the how-to part, you know. And what's most important is the reassurance of what they're doing right and what's going to go well when you write those. We're going to be putting some things on the website about social story writing. And if you Google Carol Gray, she has written some really excellent books about how to do this. After Colin got a little older, he didn't like the social stories so much. We do them orally now. We just kind of rehearse. But another one is comic strip stories. And he liked that because he'd draw characters. And he was able to process a bad situation by showing what had happened. And then we put the uh, little balloon at the top with the words, and then what would make it work better. And for some reason, that felt more grown up to him. So comic strip, or drawing it out, it sometimes can be um, a really good strategy, too. He loves videotaping. And so if you're running into kind of a, uh, a big issue that kind of is happening over and over again, we can write out a script of what would be the way to handle this. And we in, in, include him in figuring out the problem solution. And then we videotape the right way to have this conversation. And then you can go back and visit it. And he likes to go back and look at it because he's on the video, you know, and he helped create it. And it's just another little uh, technology technique that can grab our kids' interest. And you can even do it with a phone. It doesn't have to be fancy with the camera, that kind of thing. Um, Role playing is also what we do. Now that he's uh, older, it, I've shortened it a lot. You know how when you take the young, a little one like to McDonald's and they're playing on the playground and it's time to go and they don't want to come? <laughs> and it's not just me who ran into that. I did a lot because I'm grandma and I often was taking him for those kinds of things. And um, what we did then was rehearse. Now when I say five minutes, you'll know it's time, and then two minutes. We always did a countdown. And when, when I say it's time to go now, what are you going to say? And then he would tell me, yeah, okay, and he didn't always know at the beginning. He said, okay, Mimi, I'm coming. And we would practice that before we got out of the car and went into McDonald's. We even do that now, he's 15. I mean, we don't go to McDonald's very often. But it's like I remind him, now when it's time to go, because stopping, a favorite activity is difficult, even with our teens and adults. And we rehearse. Now, when I tell you it's time to go, you're going to say, and he'll say, "Okay, I'm coming." Uh, so it's you know it's gotten shorter and shorter as he's gotten older, but we still need to do that. And I get caught up when I've forgotten to do that and say, "Oh, that's right, we didn't practice this. Now, what are you going to say?" So those are just some tried and true techniques that work. Um, another thing that, that the social thinking does, uh, which is, I, I, we've got that as a resource on the handout, um, is written by Michelle Garcia Winner. Some really interesting ways of thinking about how kids learn socially. 
is that um, you ask them to think about the other person. I'm thinking about you thinking about me. For example, yesterday he got up with bedhead and we were going to go to a class and he looked a mess. He looked really sloppy. And I said, I want you to just dampen your hair and, you know, look nice before we go. And he turns to me and says, Mimi, I just don't care. And so I thought, okay, now what do I say besides do it because I told you to, <laughs> because I know that doesn't work with him. He's a teenager. So I said, okay, think about what somebody else thinks. Think about what you think when somebody looks really messy and sloppy. Well, it looks like they don't care about what they look like. And I said, do you want people thinking, other people would think that about you too? And he says, well, I kind of don't care. And he said, <laughs> But I pressed it. <laughs> Some, a, a wise person told me, maybe you should have said to him, well, I do care, because he cares about what I think. So anyway, he did eventually do it because I cared about it. And you want to know what happened today? <laughs> I picked him up again, and his hair was a mess. And I said, uh, uh, I think you need to comb your hair a little bit. And he says, oh, I know. Walked into the bathroom. He says, all right. And he wet the comb and crushed it. And, you know, and I didn't even have to ask him. He just kind of gets that, you know, it matters what he looks like. And then I kind of reinforced that. You give an impression of somebody who cares about how you look and uh, about other people. And he went, so anyway, I know you're <laughs> laughing about that, but <laughs> there are times when it's important to care about what you look like. <laughs> so those kinds of little strategies tended to work. So. Anyway, um, does anybody have any questions that you'd like to get started with today? Yeah? Yeah. Um, I have a daughter who's going into first grade, and her, she and her brother are going to be going to the same school. Um, and last year in kindergarten, she was final school for the first two to three weeks, and then she decided she hated it and wanted to run away. How can I help her and her teachers and her brother deal with the letdown in a couple of weeks after school starts of her, she's probably going to try and run and find him. How do I help him? How do I help her teachers and her just with that whole situation? Would one of you like to address that first? Why does she want to run away? Yeah. Because they don't want her to do what she wants to do. <laughs> she's six. I think <laughs> Okay, well, what would she like to do in such school, I suppose? It's kind of um, she would just want to spend time playing with the adults and you know, just call her all day. Sure. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's kind of hard with someone that's six, you know. What exactly is it going on? Is it just natural six people, six year old behavior? Is it just anxiety? Maybe that's her way of coping with anxiety, coping with change. Maybe okay. it's just a way of figuring out really just kind of doing your best to kind of figure out ways you can make school less stressful and more and more enjoyable things kind of figure out ways to kind of at least make it sound like or at least make her think that's something that she wants to do uh, and if that doesn't work then it could be a larger problem maybe instead maybe she's scared of other kids did she go to kindergarten at all is it first grade um yes she can go how'd that go for her it went pretty good. She had a very structured classroom, so that's why I was surprised that she moved away. Oh, okay. Because she was structured. Well, maybe you ask her then what she liked about kindergarten. You know, what, <coughs> what she like. You know, what was her favorite part of kindergarten? And if you convince her that the same, the same good things could happen potentially in first grade, and kind of with the teachers that could be a good stuff. Kind of shooting the dark a little bit. Hopefully, yeah. they help a little bit. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you can Are we here? Someone that's actually like raised like six year olds in kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> um, my daughter's eight, she'll be in one of the third grade, and we've seen the same pattern now for the same three or four years where the first two months of Emily's um, school year is pretty great. And then it usually dips around the time of time change, um, daylight savings, things like that, and then we usually, November, December, January are her worst parts of the whole year. It has nothing to do with um, not doing what she wants. It has to do with the, inter of the external demands placed on her and the difference. Like right now, she's riding high. There's daylight all the time. 
um, whatever weather suits her right now, and then the stressors add, and we've kind of just, uh, figured out that in the winter air times, after the first two months or two and a half months of school, when the light starts changing, the fluorescent lights bother her more, the uh, crowds bother her more. All those things that didn't bother her so much bothered her in the winter time. And I myself have a general anxiety disorder, and those are my tough times too. You have less daylight, you have less interaction, you are, uh, it's cold outside. There's all these different factors that come into play for Emily, where um, it's just it is harder to teach her and it's harder to have her focus because she her aquarium is full. What we do with her teachers is we tell Emily is an aquarium, and every she always wakes up with it pretty full. But then you add uh, fluorescent lights, that's some rocks. You add in um, her scratchy clothes, that might be a plant, and everything raises up that level of stress and anxiety, and then it overflows. In the winter time, her aquarium is all the way full when she wakes up. In the summer, not so much. So it might be just her internal structure. I would watch it again this fall and see if, if this is about the same time when she starts doing something, then um, something's bothering her that she can't tolerate in the in those months that she can tolerate in the other months. It's, it's a little that, fluid regression of sorts. That is something I can really relate to because I know what that's like. Uh, stressors add up and it just gets higher until the point where you just can't, can't handle it anymore. I've dealt with that for a long time. What I would recommend is find activities that she can do more so <coughs> in the winter time that would uh, de-stress her, give her some distractions, give her something just to do something a little bit different, just to, as a, to relax, to kind of just produce it. You, you might not be able to get rid of all of the anxiety, but even reducing it a little bit is going to help. It's going to help a lot. And, oh, sorry. And, and, you know, to play off of what John's saying, well, both of you really, everyone really, um, you said, how do you help the teacher and her brother to deal with this? You know, if they can, if her teacher has a way of being able to reward her with a little bit of time to do something that's a preferred activity, giving her that little break, that little bit of a different activity that she feels some sense of control and a favored activity could help to lower her anxiety level a little bit. And her brother, if he can just remind her, well, remember, when you get home, you're going to have you know, this much time, you're going to be able to do that as soon as you get home this afternoon. But we have to, you know, we have to do our jobs during the day, and, you know, I don't know if, if that would help him to be able to remind her that she is going to get those breaks, because it really is about building up stamina and tolerance to some degree, isn't it? Yeah. And, and if he can remind her of that, that may help her to build her stamina for doing the things that she doesn't have control over and aren't necessarily the things that she wants to do in that moment. Yes. But yeah, they did that with my son. He was in middle school, but with her color, he got something she likes. I mean, if he did his work, and he got to spend the last 10 minutes playing video games or getting on the computer, things that he really wanted at that moment. So waiting until he got home, and that was a stretch. So they would try to do it at the end of school, you bring all your stuff in, I'll check you out to make sure you did what you needed to do. This was middle school. And then you get this much time on the computer doing what you want to do. And that was really, really helpful. So, you know, maybe if she, you know, accomplishes the, and, and let them leave the class or go to enough, another spot to color for 15 minutes, kind of as a reward. They can incorporate that in the class, that really helps. And then I'm thinking, uh, going off on that. And for a six-year-old, a visual schedule might be better, too. Like Emily had a picture of, she has to do math. She has to do this, and then she can do this. And it usually started out as three pegs or three pictures, and now she's built up to a nice schedule. But um, using those visual aids, whether it's a word or a picture or something like that, because sometimes the words kind of get lost, especially when her aquarium level rises. If I, I, I may expand on that as well, is uh, when I was in elementary school, and this was back in the 90s, 
Um, we did have a very similar system for that too. There was a motivation to do your school work, to, uh, to do well in school, because at the end of the day, if I get everything done of the school work, go on to the old Mac 2 and play Oregon Trail. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting as we're speaking about helping a child on the, your daughter's on the spectrum, is that the first thing we went to was the environment. And I think that's really a smart way to think about it. Think about it, what is there in this situation that may be causing some anxiety or struggle of some kind. Uh, but also a thing to think about, it, and you can consult with the teacher about this, does it happen at a certain time? Like is it around math? I mean is it either maybe it's what she's being asked to do is either too difficult or maybe too easy. And so she's getting frustrated about that. So I think those things are things to think about as well, but particularly, and this came to me as you were talking um, earlier, it, that time for that, that sensory break during the day, rather than waiting until the end of the day. Um, that's something that we're gonna, t now that we're talking about this today, we're gonna talk with this teacher about, um, because he's in high school and he has resource time. Well, resource time is where you work on schoolwork, you do social skills, things like that. But he needs that downtime also. So he comes in and he wants to automatically go over to the computer or something and play a game for just five or two minutes. Well, you know, that's really a sensory break that he needs to have. He gets in trouble <laughs> for not getting settled right away with the, what's going on in the resource room. So that is something we need to look at as well for this older child as well, that break from the pressure and the expectations. Um, I wanted to add to if he is running, or I'm sorry, if she is running from her brother, if that's like a common thing, that within the sensory break or within these breaks, that maybe that can be built in with the brother. Like if she stays in the classroom, then brother can come and visit for a short time before he goes to lunch or something. To reassure her brother's still there, but then maybe she won't see him out. It'll be a more appropriate situation where they can check in with each other. I can yeah. speak to that as well. I'm a twin. And I was the really shy twin. And in kindergarten, it was traumatic for me to be separated from my sister. Well, we were both in the same classroom. And the way the teachers did it, they made, we still took naps. Nap on different sides of the room, which was really awful because I couldn't see her. And then I had to stand at the back, and she stood at the front of the line, and we gradually. But all the way through second grade, I would look for my sister in the hall as we would go like to the gym or music or something. And when I could see her, you know, we wave, and I just remember that sense of relief. Oh, you know, it's like it's kind of like a security blanket. And then gradually, I could get past it. But that, I, I think that's a really important thing to bring out is that sense of comfort is important. Isn't that something? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, I was going to say just to make it an appropriate way of speaking off that. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Um, Okay, so I heard from Barb and other people that you shouldn't have consequences or whatever at home for how your day went at school. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense because it, you know, I'm sure the child isn't trying to be difficult, but did you, your parents help motivate you in school by saying, okay, you get extra time with your video game if you can make it at home, if you make it through your day or whatever it is, or, or else, if you don't do what they're asking, you only get this amount of time or whatever. Or don't you want you to yeah. remember? I mean, that, yeah. I would say that that was about what happened. So it was motivational to do it. It wasn't like a, you're <laughs> grounded if you don't do well in school. It was more of uh, you get a little bit uh, less limited play time. But uh, you do you did your homework and you survived the day, uh, you get uh, a little bit of extra time, I would say. And then do you guys find that too? We do that with Emily. Um, we don't penalize her for um, her meltdowns or her stress-filled days, but we do, we've done things where if you don't, um, when Emily gets melted down or her aquarium pulls over, she has a tendency to hit and bite and throw huge, large objects. and. Um, we told her if you make it through X amount of days without throwing or hitting or biting, you could do this. And I didn't, um, I made it, 
don't know, I, I didn't make it sound like, you know, if you make it through this, you get to do this, but yeah. if you don't, you're bad. It was just, if you can do this, you can, you know, then, then you get this reward. And she did it, which I was surprised because it was the middle of December, thank the Lord, but she did. And I, that was a special thing for her. And as she gets older and gets better, those impulses, it, like now Emily, when she gets mad, she'll, and then she puts her hand down. That's huge than what she did last year. And so every year will get better, and every year gets You're better. You're rewarding her for self-control. We're rewarding her self-control, finding it a different out way, her and giving her different it. techniques. Yeah. She has her lemon squeezes, she party blows. We, we try to use um, the friction, or the feeling of, of air in her, in her cheeks as a pressure. <coughs> um, we give her squeezes. We're finding different techniques so she can advocate and, and express her, her frustrations in a non-harmful way. I don't want to suppress what she's got going on, but she's got to find a different way. Hitting is not acceptable. Biting is not acceptable. Throwing rocking chairs is not acceptable. But lemon squeezes, stomping feet. She can even scream. That's Some people don't like that. But as far as I'm concerned, she can scream. It's not hurting anybody. This is, this is one of the conversations that my daughter and I often have because of Colin's mom. She'll say, you know, I, I want him to know that I don't, I can't tolerate, or I don't uh, want him to be using bad language, which he learned to do in middle school because that was one of his ways of establishing that he was a strong kid and don't pick on me because I can do as well as I can <laughs> take, you know. So, um, but he knows, we talked to him about that, well, there's certain places you can say and do that. We'd rather you didn't do it at school, but, you know, if you're really upset, you can do it in the car and then it's over. But, um, so she, she says, how do I get that through to him? How do I let him know? Well, he knows from talking about it and practicing places to do it appropriate and that kind of thing. So what she struggles with is, like I grew up in the era where you're in trouble at school, you're in trouble even more at home. You know, that was the way it was, you know, back in the 50s when I was in elementary school. And um, it's changed a lot since then, and particularly for our kids, that punishment for something that they maybe couldn't control, like a meltdown, yeah. or losing control, is not, we try to think of it as they handled it. It was handled at school. We can talk about it later when he's calm, and that's the time that he processes well anyways when he's calm. Talk about it, discuss it, maybe practice what could you do the next time, and then leave it. And he's a nice kid. I mean, he's well behaved. When he gets upset, he's learning that self-control and he catches himself. So it's working. I mean, it, it and I really appreciate that, too, because let me just say this. I believe that you should not punish for a meltdown. I don't have control when I melt down. That's something that's a part of Asperger's, and you reach your stress level. It happens. I wish it didn't. I, kind of, I do whatever I can to prevent a meltdown. So don't punish for meltdown, just discuss it and try to put in a plan to find ways to relieve that stress so you never reach that point. And if you do reach that point, find a way of how to diffuse it. So it's also slightly amended though, a little bit, because I mean, there's, there's constructive ways that a meltdown and there's destructive mm -hmm. ways we can have a meltdown too. So I mean, then you run into the situation where like, you're, I'm not gonna punish for the meltdown, but if the meltdown involves, for example, tell temper tantrums in public where the child is cursing things that probably you probably don't want coming out of a behavioral's mouth and not target. You know. That's true. Um, figuring out a the best approach would be kind of working with your child to figure out a way. It's like, okay, because you're not gonna stop the child from freaking out. I still have my freak out, so less frequent. Never see them, so it's very good hiding them. But um, but again, that's the thing. I've, I've learned how to kind of control that and hide basically in my room or whatever and sort out my stuff there. So working with your child to as positive as possible so that way they can kind of sort their stuff out in the, more, in the most constructive way possible. Um, well, not emphasizing punishment. I have another suggestion that's uh, on a different direction. You said the fall and winter, you guys kind of get a little bit depressed because of the sunlight. But have you ever thought of doing light therapy? We actually, Shell, 
donated hers at the end of last winter, and we started doing that in the morning, waking up to the blue lights and going to sleep at the evening, and it seemed to help pick up a little bit. Now we're going to incorporate that into a solid routine this winter in hopes that, that you know, we've been adding things. And, and, you know, every year it seems like we find something different and new, and so we won't have it. What, what about getting your vitamin D levels checked? Because uh, we could. Yes. In, or, you know, even just taking a, a supplement because that's, you know, supposed to. Yeah. yeah. So every year we, you know, getting stuff inside my daughter is next to impossible. But as far as myself, you know, I can, I just, I more identify with what she's got going on. I know by no means autistic or on the spectrum, but as far as the anxiety and the executive functioning, <laughs> sometimes I can, like when Barbara talked about executive functioning, that keeps us in our chair. Um, and when it's hot, some people have less of a tolerance for it. It would be sticky, gross in there. Some people would be like, you know what, this is all I can handle. And they would leave, and some people would be like, I can wait this out a little bit longer. And when the executive functioning fails is when you have to add those supplements like the blue light and all those other things. I think environmental can play I, the Environmental, is, I think it is. I think it's huge. I mean, there's always different factors. And, um, mm -hmm. In one of these other presentations, it's executive functioning and part of your brain helps you tolerate and do certain things. And um, with the lack of it for some ASD people, like I said, Emily gets to a point where she's like, that's it, I'm done. You know, but we have a little bit more executive functioning, so I'm like, I'm done with this, but I'm going to sit here quietly until everybody's done. You know, that's, that sometimes is their difference, and I don't think it's a bad difference. I mean, wouldn't it be great if you're just like, you know, I'm done with this. <laughs> just, you know, I've had enough, I'm good. I'm, you not, know. I'm, I'm not sure if it's true for neurotypical people, but I know for myself with Asperger's, a change of a season, my brain feels very different, each season okay. change. And it goes through a different um, emotion for each season. And things all around me just feel totally different. My sensory is, is picking up on things that are so different that it almost feels like um, things are just kind of getting twisted around up there. So yeah, changing of season is a big thing about sensor, about sensory. Because you know, you're indoors, you're outdoors. We use, we have the sunlight to fluorescent light. The ratio is a little bit different, but you know, she can't tolerate the fluorescent light, so we have to supplement. Yeah, fluorescent lights can have a little bit of a flutter to them, and, and um, that is what can really hit it. So the sad light, you know, that they use is, is not a fluorescent, but no. it's not, so it stays on. Solid. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I hate fluorescent flickers. I, I, I think that's universal, isn't it? Everybody hates <laughs> well, no, these well, things. Well, I it, it throws it really throws me off. Uh, um, sharp noises, especially. That's oh really yes, good. sharp noises. Yeah. <laughs> I learned how to actually fix fluorescent lights a lot because they actually like I've actually learned how to like actually do repairs on them because they it, 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 it hurt me so much. They like, actually read how to actually like, take them apart and. Uh, Resolder some of the wire rings and they click or less. You need a job at the part of the system. <laughs> 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 and don't be afraid to ask for those accommodations either. In the we cut we have um we have lights that are completely dismantled over Emily's workstation so she doesn't have the hum directly over her lights. We also have the rest of them covered um in her room um for at Lewis and Clark because some of the kids are so, you know, uh, exposed to this light. So maybe you can make those accommodations, absolutely. That is a very good idea. Yeah. It was really nice. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask. Does it make a big difference when, when there's fluorescent light covers? As long as, they, as long as they don't follow like covers for them, um, it could. Um, like, yeah. so the, the big thing that throws me off those flickering, um, lighting itself is not bad. I actually like prefer like low lighting, but that's because I'm kind of a, a weird person that likes living in dark places. But. <laughs> Um, but I don't mind fluorescent lights as long as they don't do the point of the night. So that's the big thing for me. I was just going to throw something else out to consider is how the other kids are in the classroom. The worst time actually for my son is at the end of the year and I think the classroom gets really squirrely. A little bit louder. Oh, sorry, I thought I was talking pretty loud. Um, the other kids in the classroom can get really squirrely, especially right before Christmas break, I found. And before the end of school, and I found my son will hold it together really well at school. And then when he comes home, I ended up talking to his teacher several times last year, 
and I could pinpoint exactly when she said, yeah, we've been having a lot of issues with the classroom. Because it's just, it's just too much. That, that chaos is really hard to do. Well, with, so. kudos to him for holding it together at school because that's really, <laughs> I mean, that, that yeah. says a lot. And then home is the place he can just let down and exactly. let it out. That's true for a lot of kids, especially our kids. So. Mm -hmm. They can feel a lot of what we feel, like I've noticed that you have, I mean, I have to maintain a huge sense of zen when dealing with Emily and talking to her, and when she gets um, up into her yellow zone, which is her uh, identifying color for her, when she gets frustrated. And um, as in point, when you said with Christmas vacation, everybody's buzzing, and even the adults, you can see their little balloons. I have this to do, this to do, this, 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 this. These kids can feel that. I, at least Emily can. I know she can. She for, can feel for all the kids who senses. aren't supposed to be able to pick up on social cues, do you guys experience that too? You can <laughs> just feel uh, an atmosphere? Or yes. Like yes. It's hard for me to pick up on body language or reading people, but for some reason I can pick up on their emotions. And when somebody else is frustrated or anxious, I feel the exact same way. Despite the smile on their face. Chris, do you have that I really suck at reading emotions no matter what I do. So I, I think I, I think I try I think I get like vibes and stuff sometimes. That's but I'm always yeah. but I'm always second guessing what those are. So I've kind of actually learned to tune it out a bit and just kind of be a little nice slave. Because that's because I mean, shoot, I think I think that's how people are in general. Like a lot of times we just stink at reading other people's emotions. That isn't just located to this AS. We think we know, but we don't until we actually communicate with them. But the problem is, I, I grew up in seven different states, so I have the experience of living on the coast. Both of us, Alaska's by technically by the Arctic, but anyways, um, by New Jersey as well as uh, Alaska and North Dakota. Uh, it, it throws me off just how much you all stink at expressing your emotions correctly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's horrible. <laughs> You know, but that's a side brand. You had your hand raised for a while, Bill. One so. thing I'd like to just point speak out up a little that bit? We, might, we might not be aware of is, you know, during that week before Christmas vacation and the last couple of weeks of school, I, I, I have a kid who's now homeschooled, but he was in public school to the end of first grade. And I was talking to Barb back in the day when he was that little. He's really struggling. And we're having a difficult time with him in the classroom. She's like, you know, he doesn't have to be there. What? You can make an accommodation for these times when they're not on their normal schedule. They're not really learning very much that last week before Christmas vacation. There are parties and different activities that are not part of the schedule. The last two weeks of school, they're not in their normal routine. Make different accommodations, or we actually just the last two weeks of first grade, she wrote a letter to the school, and we have body excuse. They don't have to be there. If it's that stressful for your kid, and you that's okay, accommodations that's great. But if if the accommodations aren't working and they're still so stressed after they're having those huge meltdowns when they get home, it's not worth. So that might be something for you to consider. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, I, I, I guess I've heard it some from some parents, and I want you guys not to think that way. Your child is not regressing. Your child is not getting less. Your child is not going backwards. It's this fluid ups and downs. I mean, think about what you guys, you know, some people are more active in the summer, some people are more active in the winter. It's this fluid up and downness. So when they have these struggles, they're not going backwards and they're not regressing into anything awful. They're just, their aquarium's getting fuller. I, take some plants out, man. Get some rocks, move them around. It's, it's not, make the accommodations for them. I, you know, I do that with myself, and, and it's still hard at 43. So these kids that are 8, 6, 12, 15, 22 even, that's fluid. Yeah, roll with it. Isn't that in John, John Candy say that? Go ahead. Okay, so I find that it's a guessing game with my son sometimes, like what is causing him more stress at school, and I'm sure <laughs> everyone feels that way, but do you have suggestions on how, and he doesn't seem to be able to tell us, he can't say it. I'm frustrated because of the lights and because of the noise and the Christmas parties. He can't tell us. If, even if you ask him, at least most of the time he can't. How yeah. old is your son? Eleven. Okay. Is that a school to home notebook? What did, did you say a school to home notebook? Do you have a school to home notebook where the teacher tells you what's going on during the day? And charts the day? We email 
or talk on the phone. But I mean, it's going to be a different school now. It's going to middle school. You should school. ask them for daily emails or daily journals. And that's how I figured well, the pattern and for Emily. Just for the school to figure out, like, what are they? We called they in the OT and mm -hmm. said, would you please look at this classroom? Because that happened between third and fourth grade. And, and the teacher was lovely. Them. The classroom was a nice bunch of kids, very supportive. But it was different, you know. And, and look, she looked at lights and placement and who he was near. Well, there was a kid behind him who kept bumping his desk. Just not at first on purpose <laughs> just because he was and then he figured out that it got rise so you know but those things um those little things like that they he was sitting at one time he was sitting right near the pencil sharpener which drove him crazy when somebody would go and do that and so having now those seem those are kind of simplistic but an ot can really kind of zero in on what might be different about that room than another and the one. slp as well that's yeah. i mean it's i speak the language i found that the OT too. And I think that the yeah, and I think the speech and language therapists are, are great, and and setting up the whole context for we're going to be detectives in our house. I know that I'm the lead detective, right? My husband's really good at it sometimes, and we've even trained my son to start. I mean, we planted those seeds long, long ago that we're going to be detectives. We're going to play Sherlock Holmes, and. This is, this is the answer we're looking for. So let's start right here and sort of work our way back. So and I just wonder, was it hard for you guys to communicate that to your teacher or your friends when or I was your younger, family to say that this is? Yeah, when I was younger, it was difficult to actually identify or even verbalize what was bothering me. But as I got older and more experienced with it, I was able to pinpoint exactly what's causing my problems and uh, talk to somebody about it. So. We, we talked to Colin as well and said, it looks like this is what the issue is. Pay attention to this for a couple of days and see what you think. And now he can, he can identify that. And there's a big difference between 11 years old and 15. And we saw a huge growth in that self-awareness just by talking about those kinds of things. So figuring it out doesn't, for us to figure it out doesn't help unless we clue him on, in on it too. Because sometimes he just needed that concrete explanation of what's going on and then he could say yay or nay and uh, then now he speaks up when he just went to a college for kids class this week and he told the teacher right up front I don't work that well with the group noise really bugs me and sometimes I just need to get away for a little while and I nice. thought that was wonderful I was thrilled that he could do that. Mm -hmm. Chris did you want to? Uh, you know, I really was never all that good. It's kind of weird because I wasn't diagnosed with ASL after high school. So I didn't have like an IEP or anything that I could turn to. So, yeah. Uh, you know, ask, so that kind of put me in a weird spot in terms of just asking for accommodations. So I really didn't even have a ground to start with. I, I, and I never really got any good. I got better at it, like when I when I started uh, undergraduate at uh, NDSU, uh, that's when I got diagnosed. So that's the, but I knew the structure. That was the key. Like I actually had structure, you know. Otherwise, you know, you just when you're younger, you know. Well, at least I felt this way. I always felt it was kind of the mercy of the teaching overboards, basically. You know, it's like I just and, and usually I didn't even want to like make waves. I just wanted to get the just get my stuff done, punch out, and get out. And get um, I didn't want to go through the extra hoops when I was younger to really, you know, even if the hoops would have helped me, it, it, that was just too much work, so. What would you have asked for if you could? You would have had patience. I, I guess, I don't even know if I would know what, really, what the context would have meant, but if I go back in time, like parent myself or something like that. Maybe. But um, a lot more patience in terms of just when a lot of times when I just get really frustrated with assignments when I just start reading out maybe a little bit, maybe when I don't want to play with the other kids because of just people overload. So processing time basically and allowing you to, when I put stuff into my daughter's IEP, I'm not really all that concerned whether she can add or subtract or say things or not say things. I want her to advocate for herself and, you know, and the reason I ask that first is because if you had an IEP, you said you'd ask for patience and, and processing time and that should be first and foremost on an IEP 
Um, I went to talk to some nurses at the, um, it's not, it's not more high tech anymore, but it's more high tech in my head. Um, thank you. And I asked them, I said, you know what, I said, when you ask a question, I said, just be quiet for 10 seconds and just watch them. Just, just ask me a question and I'm just going to stare at you for 10 seconds. That's a huge long time. But that's how long it only takes to sometimes answer a question. And if I asked it again at six seconds or four seconds, she would have to start over. Mm -hmm. 10 seconds, 20 seconds. So now we're into a minute or so, and, or you know, and it, you know, things like that. That's where I find important that an IEP is first and foremost to ask for things like accommodations of that sort so the child can grow up and accommodate and advocate for themselves. Math comes later. Let's forget. There's an app for that. <laughs> Did you have a question earlier? Yeah, but, you know, I was thinking of the original question. You know, a month or so into school, um, demands change. And you know, we've been focusing on environmental things that are bombarding you know, whoever. And that demand change is something that we don't notice, we, but they notice. And we've noticed with our, our son, you know, the first week or so, establishing some routines, reacquainting with friends. Uh, teachers are trying to get to know you. Teachers are keeping things light. And about four, five, six weeks into it, now it's tests, now it's papers. And you know, middle school, high school, it's five or six or seven different teachers that <coughs> are unaware of what the other teachers are doing. Elementary, I think it's better. Classroom teacher can balance those things, but that demand and expectation change mm -hmm. might be part of, you know, for your dog, daughter. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's just a question, teacher. Are you really ramping things up instead of five pages a week to read? Now it's up to ten. At the same time, now we have, now we're doing math. Everything's all culminating. And as a teacher, I think that's a really important observation. You shift from, as you say, getting acquainted, setting up the routine and the environment, and reviewing, and then you move into new material. And so I think that's a really important piece that could be going on as well. Now I can see where that would be uh, frustrating for some kids on the spectrum. I was kind of lucky, actually, like that system. The slowly getting back into school, getting reacquainted, getting some uh, routine set up, and then moving into, gradually into more work. That was, that was a slow transition, and it was a lot better than go to school, test, test, test. The just starting, and then expectation just slowly rising a little bit over the course of the first month, I found that to be a blessing, actually, because it was a slow transition and it helped me a lot. But I can see where it would be difficult for, for some other kids, though. They're, everybody's different. So we're we're sort of winding down. What did you have a question? Well, I was just going to mention when we were talking about like when we were talking about um, you know the just Figuring out. Oh, figuring out. Like we sometimes have a hard time with like somebody, the teacher, or somebody telling us maybe what triggered it, and we don't get the answers from our son unless we ask those specific ones. That, that is that so is huge. huge. <laughs> yeah. He's fifteen. Okay, so if I asked him why he exploded at the teacher and got suspended at school this last year. I would say, you know, why did you yell at him? I don't know. Everything's, I don't know, I don't know. So what I would do then is, is okay, what what were you doing in class? You know, break it down, like, what were you doing? Well, when we, when we broke it down to what was happening, we found out another person, another teacher was behind him, told him to do something, and then to go to the office. So he was getting in trouble and getting sent to the office well, he didn't feel like he did anything wrong to have to go to the office, and his response was, no, I'm not going. So it escalated, and then he got in trouble, but we didn't know. You know, I kept saying, well, why did you have to go to the office? I don't know. I don't know. Well, he didn't really know why he had to go to the office. 
But then when I broke it down to say, well, what happened or, you know, what were you doing at that time? That's when I found out this other person had said something to him. Then when I asked him, did that upset you? Yes. Well, you know, be, why did it upset you? Because I didn't do anything wrong. He said, I did this. I didn't do it. So breaking it down to maybe trying to find what happened and asking it a specific way, I got totally a different story from him than what the teachers saw. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really interesting, though, that I don't, you don't get the questions unless you ask it a specific way. And he's just now 15 and we're learning that. And so, another thing that helped us, too, was to say, okay, and then what happened right before? Mm -hmm. And, you know, because, and, and you're really onto something there, asking them the right questions really helps because so much happened, it's hard for them to figure out and back up. But if you can compartmentalize it like that and break it down for them. Well, that's even with like about T kids, my 10 year old boy is like that too. You have to break something down to small time frames. So, Chris and John, I'm, I'm just wondering if there's anything you would want parents to know, you know, as we, we're wrapping up, we've got, you know, literally yes. about um, two, let's see, what's on my watch? We've got about two minutes left. Yes, I What is it that you want parents to know in terms of this transition back to school? Okay, I actually have some stuff written down. We've covered most of the stuff. There's a few things that I would like to share, but okay. it's not the personal experience. Um, remember that right before school starts, there's going to be a, there's going to be some anxiety, and for me, once we start on August one, I start getting very anxious worked up because August means school is coming soon. So do what you can to try to keep August a positive month. Otherwise there's going to be this repeating fear of the actual month itself because there's going to be an emotional attack to that month. So do things that are rewarding, do things that you can do, but then also don't forget to slowly transition like you were saying before. Um, find things that uh, your children can look forward to after school to help them as a motivation. With buying school supplies, don't wait for the la don't wait for the last minute. To buy those maybe two or three weeks before school starts, so then you get these supplies, and then you give them a chance to also um, kind of calm down after that because buying school supplies will add to anticipatory anxiety. And another thing that I find helpful is just go online, find some tense and release guides. You know, the tense your muscles and then release, that can help with relaxation. But everything else, though, that I have written on down here was already covered by either myself, my partner here, or people in the audience. So do you want to, have it, want to add anything else? It can... Uh there's a lot of different things that can cause anxiety, can cause fear, a lot of different things. The change, uh, the bad memories, the, just a lot of things, or even just sensory overload, just a lot of different things. Like we, we, did, we covered a plethora of just random things. We even went down the road of possibly like vitamin D. Like so I'm, I'm not an expert in that area. Like I, I, I really have not, like, I know like a lot of people with AS have changed their diet substantially, not me. I like my gluten in my, uh, my milk too much to, uh, to say no to that. I, I just like to work around it. But um, I guess it's, it's just a matter of just trying to do your best to you know be patient, to work with your child. Again, patience, patience, patience. Just don't learn down patience and just keep plugging away and keep trying to figure out what the situation is. You know, If you think you've hit a dead end, then be sure to ask questions and advice, you know, maybe because usually you haven't hit the dead end. You just write out of ideas. You just probably get some more ideas. And, more and ideas. if you run into a dead end, you might want to try to take a different path as well. Something isn't working out the right way, change paths and try something else, and that might lead to better success. It's kind of experimentation, but everybody is different. But, yeah. And also, uh, one thing I'd also like to say is that after the first week of school, celebrate it. You got through the first week of school. It's a great idea. That is a great thing, a milestone. 
go out to eat, do something special. What if we celebrate that the, all of us got food the first day? <laughs> we played ahead the night before, we have our lunches packed, you know? Yeah. Maybe then it was kind of like, oh. Yeah, all, everybody in the family, Xers, uh, celebrate that you got through the first week of school. That's what I did all the time. We did some, I got through the first week of school. I was nervous going into school. After, but I knew at the end of the week, we celebrate the milestone of surviving the first week of school. And you celebrate that, and that reinforces positive thoughts to it. We're, we're really, we hit our time limit. Um, and if you have some one-on-one -on -one questions, I think we have to sort of exit the room. Are we still? By 1.15. We have to be out of the room by 1.15, but if you'd like to ask questions one-on-one -on -one or continue the conversation, please feel free to do so. Thank you for being here. If you have any other questions, you can contact us on the website. And if uh, uh, um, you have a question, you can contact us on the website. Oh, okay. Uh,